Come round here, oh love. Come. Come round here, oh love, come round here, come round here, oh love. Come Come round, come round, come round here. Oh, love. Come Come round here, love, with gratitude for all who make it possible for us to be with each other on this glorious day of celebration. Ah! Call in your love. Call the ones who you would come to be with us now, too, in your heart of hearts. Call us to come round here. Come round. The ones whose names we do not know. Come round. The Algonquin speakers who kept this glorious garden alive for so many centuries. Come round here. Come round here. We are calling you come round here. oh
come round. Come round here. Come around 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 here. Come on round here, right here. Come round here. Come round here, right, right here, right now. Come round here, this beautiful round, round. Earth, come around here, love. We need you, love. Come around here, we're calling you. Come round, come round. Kumbaya, love. Come round, kumbaya, love. Come round here. Kumbaya, love. Come round. Come round, love, come I hope you will help me welcome you here. So if everyone just say, welcome. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today to Radical Aliveness, this symposium we have on spirituality and, and social change. Uh, I'm Rob Cox, I work here in the archive and I'm sort of the carnival barker today. Uh, so hope you don't mind. I'll be up here for just a brief to introduce everybody. But we're here today, it's an honorary October day, it's a beautiful day, best month of the year in New England. It's uh, such a good month that it actually lasts eight weeks in New England, maybe a little bit more. And on your way in, you may have noticed that this is a particularly living day, that there's a lot of activity around campus, around the climate strike and all that. And you may have seen some of that commotion and the energy and the passion that has been pent up in this country for some time now and coming out in this climate strike among other things. There's a lot of days around us that we've had in recent years, at least last two years, uh, when it may feel like we're in a state of really truly unprecedented crisis in the world where forces of reaction and deceit are primed to overwhelm us. But as a historian, I, I just have to say that the current state of the nation it feels like all that's warranted. It's not unreasonable to be concerned. But as a historian, I'm not sure that there's a particular feeling of crisis right now because the nation has been creating crisis since its very beginning. We've had genocide. We've had our original sin of enslavement. They're an indelible part of our history as our civil wars and wars for empire, Jim Crow, Joe McCarthy, Watergate, and I could go on and on and on. We're a nation of crisis and of crisis and in crisis. So the need for change is nothing new here either. But I think the opportunity we have for change right now has never been like this before. We've very seldom in our history had a moment where the opportunities for change are as great as they are now. We may be at a moment when people are finally receptive to listening, to hearing, and to acting. We may be nearing a time when we'll be receptive to the urging of the spirit to listen and to wait on the truth and to act on our conscience. And like the points of an anvil crush carbon into a diamond, maybe oppression will create solidarities and possibilities for a beautiful future. Now the idea for the symposium today is actually really pretty simple. The two organizations that sponsor this uh, carnival uh, a network for grateful living and special collections at uh, and university archives at UMass are each engaged in our own ways and work around the idea of social change. And in particular, both of us have strong interest in the spiritual dimensions of how people create and experience real and lasting change in the world. And to that end, we've gathered a few of the most interesting minds in the country, we think, to talk about the subject and take part in a conversation. Our beloved friend, Brother David Stendhal-Ross, will take the stage in the second half today, 
But if you will, let me please introduce the guests for the day, and I'll do it in alphabetical order, because that just seems ever so appropriate. So can we uh, come on stage, I think, everybody? You don't have to come in alphabetical order, that's fine. Uh, and you can sit everywhere you want. So if you will, uh, just in very brief form, first we had the force of nature, Rachel Bagby, who's a JD from Stanford and an award-winning performance artist. She's a uh, poetic innovator and a creator of the Decaz Foundation. She's author of a couple of books, Daughterhood and Divine Daughters, Liberating the Power and Passion of Women's Voices. Next, alphabetically, is Mirabai Bush, who will raise her hand appropriately. Thank you. You may know her from the area here as a person who's been engaged in social activism for, for, for a very long time. She's the founder for the Center of Contemplative Mind and Society, co-developer of Search Inside Yourself at Google, and she's the recent author, among other things, of Walking Each Other Home with the Great Ram Das. Alphabetically, number three. Oh, pardon me, I will skip number three because he will not be on the stage for the moment here. Uh, but number three A, <laughs> alphabetically, is the Reverend Dr. Gregory Allison II who will raise his hand in appropriate fashion. Gregory is the Associate Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling at Emory University, founder of Fearless Dialogues, which is a nonprofit organization that creates unique spaces for unlikely partners to have hard, heartfelt conversations on taboo subjects ranging from racism and classism to community violence, and he's the author of many works. Next, Lucas Johnson. And you'll note that the beauty of being the carnival barker here is that I did not have to prompt him to raise his hand. <laughs> Lucas has been, is the uh, current the executive director of On Being's Civil Conversations Project and a former leader of the International Fellowship of Rec Rec Reconciliation, which is the world's oldest interfaith peace organization, and I think we can all thank him for that. And last but not least, we have closest to me here, thank you, proving my adage. Christy Nelson, who will be the interlocutor today, and she is currently the development, uh, pardon me, the executive director of an executive for a grateful living. Uh, with that, I'll thank you, and we'll head on to the really reason you're here. Thank you. So welcome again. Um, I want to just take a minute, uh, in the spirit of the guests that we have here, these honorable, extraordinary people on the stage with me, I want to honor this moment to also honor all of you who are with us, um, to invite us to take one minute to just notice the privilege of this moment in time, to not let the grandeur of this opportunity pass us by. I'd like to invite everybody to take a really deep breath. So inhale and exhale with a little fervor. Let us know that you exhaled. And if you'd like to try again, if you didn't really do a great job the first time, you can do it again, ready? So inhale, let us hear you ah. Thank you. So there's good news here today. This day can stir us and offer us reasons for coming more alive, more grateful, and more hopeful. Different things brought each of us here today, but in the big picture, we can dare to assume a few things about everyone here. 
I want to invite you to just look around. So for us, it's easy to look at you, and for us, for you, it's easy to look at us, but just look around what you can, the places that you can. You can stand up if you want. The people who are here today have chosen to spend one of the most glorious afternoons of the entire year <laughs> inside in this amazing dialogue. So for that alone, you deserve great rewards. Yes, thank you. The people in this space today are big hearted, broken hearted, broken open, whole hearted, beautiful, whole people. You are surrounded by empathetic, compassionate, tender hearted, thin skinned, loving human beings with heartstrings pulled in many directions at once. We are all curious, called, concerned, courageous, and committed. Thank you. It is an honor always to gather with any number of people, with people of this caliber. Each of us is a hero among heroes, and I am humbled to be sitting on stage with some of my true deep heroes. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming today. So thank you for saying yes to this wild, out of the blue, crazy invitation for showing up so full-heartedly and for engaging in this improvisation this theater that we're in, this concern, this deep love, and showing up with your presence into our lives. So I'm gonna ask all of you, as questions are asked of our panelists, please consider the questions yourselves. Not coming up with your own answers, per se, in the moment, but resting with not knowing, resting with curiosity, but also not being passive want to invite you to listen well and deeply and let yourself be impacted by listening as a form of engagement. In that spirit, we have with us the beloved Rachel Bagby who opened our afternoon today. Um, and I'm gonna call Rachel, instead of our motivational speaker, she's gonna be our motivational listener. It's a really powerful role. It's a sacred role, especially in a culture so good at delivering information, advice, opinions, and words. Deep listening is a theme in the work of all of the people on this stage. And we're gonna explore that theme. But listening is not a tuning out, but a tuning fully in. And Rachel is going to be here as an engaged listener and then end our program with a spontaneous, um, we have an invocation and an exvocation, <laughs> an outvocation um, that will reflect her listening during our time together. So Rachel, before you tune in, I just want to ask you what and really treasure your voice because you're going to sit silently with us for a lot of this time but taking it all in what is sacred to you about listening and what does it mean to you around spirituality and social change specifically why is listening so important You never know, you never know who you're really sitting with or called to serve with. And you never know where that deep call comes from that is being shared with all of us who show up at the same place. You, you never know how connected the words that are coming out of all of our mouths are to the call that's in here. But 
what's in here knows and is also communicating at the same time that talking is happening. Mm. <laughs> and so I listen for what's happening underneath what we're doing with our mouths. Yeah. And so I listen and do my best to heed what wisdom I can hear or discern. You never know why we have two ears and one mouth, and I want to use them well. They're really small, my ears. <laughs> but the ear in the middle of the heart is really deep. And I, I just want to honor what it means to call on the depths, especially now. We could just kind of be done. <laughs> 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 we could all just sit up here and listen to you. Yeah. I mean, there is that sense of deep connection now named so beautifully by our friend, Rachel, thank you. I want to invite, because listening is in all of your spaces so profoundly, I want to invite Anyone who is moved, you can sing, <laughs> you can speak, you can, a few words, or just share with us what is that place of sacred listening in your work and in your life? I just want to say that about, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago <laughs> or something, 20 probably, um, Rachel and I were at a women's retreat together. And um, we were playing with paper mache, and the exercise was to um, make a paper mache of what some part of your body. Rachel made an ear. I'm going to lower your lower your mic. Is it, is it taped on? Oh, it's taped on. Yes, okay, sure. good. Can you hear? Yeah, better when okay. you lower it a little bit. Thank okay. You. Thank you. So here, you all can. Deep listening. Greg? Um, you invited us to bring a, a piece that inspires us, and I'll hold that off for a minute. Um, but long ago, and I'll share that piece uh, when I'm prompted, <laughs> um, how my grandmother taught me to listen with my body um, and not just with my ears. Um, mm. But there is another piece that kind of animates me deeply. And um, Brother Lucas and I had a, a chance to on yesterday to talk a little bit about uh, Brother David's autobiography. And um, there's uh, a moment in this autobiography when he speaks about looking to the sky and recognizing that the outer space is vast, but so too is the inner space. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am a, um, a student of Howard Washington Thurman. And um, for those of you all who may not know Thurman, he was a teacher of Dr. King's. Uh, he uh, went and sat with Gandhi and brought many of the tenets of nonviolence back to the United States. Um, but Thurman has a piece called uh, The Inward Sea, and it is uh, indeed one of my favorites, and it really helps me to think about the vast capacity that is within us that we must listen to as we engage the world that is outside of us. And so I'll share this piece. Um, he says, in every person, there is an inward sea. And in that sea, there is an island. And on that island, there is an altar. 
And standing guard before that altar is an angel with a flaming sword. (laughs) And nothing can get by that angel to be placed upon that altar, on that island, in the middle of your inward sea, unless it has the fluid area of your consent. And as I hear these words, and I repeat them often, I think about what it must take, the courage, the fearlessness, the, um, the sense of mission to leave the sandy shores of the status quo and to venture out into the deep that is within us and to um, brave the stormy seas of trauma and hurt and shame to find that which is animating within us and listen deeply to that um, and to allow that, that energy to swell and, and guide us on our daily walk. Mm-hmm. Um, so I invite you all to be with us. It's so odd for me. I, I, you know, the, the work that I do is called Fearless Dialogues and I, I just feel odd in a monologue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll uh, get you going. But, but, but um, I, I would invite you all to be mindful of what's happening within and listen there because far too often in Western education, the person at the front of the room with the microphone is perceived as the one that is wisest, but there's wisdom inside. Mm. Listen there. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, Greg stole my answer. Ah. <laughs> That's my boy. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Amen. I, I think Amen. you borrowed it. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I, I think that there's. No, I, I. There's so much of that resonates, and I. There's something about. The way that we, need to. Practice listening to ourselves. Yeah. In order to create a truly hospitable place for the others we encounter. Mm -hmm. And and so many times when we're supposed to be listening to someone else, we haven't let ourselves settle and we're still talking to ourselves while we're intending to uh, be listening to someone else. Yeah. I I, I think that... um, there's a listening is you know I, I i we've talked a lot about you know sort of the ear and hearing but i love the fact that rachel drew us to the ear in our heart mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i think that listening is actually about sort of the fullness of an encounter right and and being able to be fully present with someone um, and allow allow all who all who they are all that they are to actually be present with and in you mm. and and if we can if we can do that then then that will allow the two people to sort of begin a journey together and oftentimes in you know we focus on a on trying to persuade each other as if one person must be right and one person must be wrong rather than both of us are offering what we have so that we can journey together and i i think listening is something it's a muscle that we have to you know mm-hmm. krista likes to reference these muscles that we have to train in ourselves. Mm-hmm. And we, it's, a, it's a muscle that is, I think, atrophied in our civic life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, and it's something that's important for us to recover. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Did you want to say something sure. about radical? <laughs> you've, said <laughs> that, you've said that listening is the most radi- one of the most radical acts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that. 
when you were talking about outer outer listening and inner discovery, I remembered that um, in the uh, in the fourth year of my PhD, this is kind of radical to say in a university context, but I had, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had done all my work, including my orals, and um, uh, but it was at a time not unlike this time, 1969 and 70, which was um, a, a really difficult time and a difficult time on campuses. Police took over the campus, uh, and we were very involved in civil rights and and anti-war work, and I didn't really know what I was looking for, but I kind of stumbled my way through Europe and the Middle East and into India where um, I learned to meditate. And I hadn't gone looking for that, but what I remember then is I was a student of literature, so, you know, after all those years, I'd read, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books. I always was looking outside. And of course, there was wisdom in, in those sources, but um, I remember just sitting, and the practice was to just basically sit in silence and notice what was arising in your mind. Uh, I, thoughts, emotions, sensations. And I, it really had never occurred to me that by listening within that I could, that there was truth there, that there, there was the insight. Um, and the more I did it, the more stunning that seemed. How could I have overlooked that all these years? But it was a radical shift for me. Um, and now in the last number of years, in, um, when I was uh, running the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, our mission was to um, bring contemplative practices and perspectives um, and insight into secular mainstream settings. And so during that time, I've worked with uh, lawyers and judges and um, educators, a lot, a lot over 10,000 faculty are, are network through this, who are integrating these contemplative practices into their classrooms. Uh, you know, worked with scientists and the army, um, so many social justice activists, um, ex-gang leaders in Chicago, and introducing practices. And um, al almost always a, a deep listening or a mindful listening practice. And I see over and over people listening to each other and with a simple practice of noticing, I mean, it's in a way, it's the flip side of discovering that you can look within for wisdom, but uh, is that um, you sit and listen in silence to the other person and as your thoughts and desires and memories and opinions arise, uh, you just notice them and let them go and bring your attention back to the person who's speaking. Mm. And there are various permutations of this practice. But it's so interesting that for so many people, that is a radical experience. They realize how so much of the time in listening we're thinking, oh, you know, I know just what you should do about that, or just all kinds of memories of your own, um, and that we very rarely really sit and listen. And when we do, um, there's an intimacy and a, a truth, no matter what's being said, between you as the listener and the person who's speaking. So, um, and of course, it's been incredibly helpful in terms of um, working in the field of social justice and trying to figure out how in the world to um, make a contribution toward mm. truth and justice and equity uh, at a time that's so confusing. Thank you. It's a, it's a theme we want to pick up um, today, I think, which is how, you know, we've got three people here on stage. We've got Greg with this adjective fearless. We've got Lucas with civic 
and Mirabai with contemplative, right up front in what, what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. You're describing, and it's, and it's extremely interactive. It's very, basically you're naming up front fearless dialogue, civic conversation, contemplative mind. And I would love to ask each of you what that term that you wrap your work around right now in some way, what that means to you related to listening, related to being, um, related to the work that you do in the world to make a difference. Where does fearlessness figure in for you, Greg? Yeah, um, we, we, uh, we started Fearless Dialogues back in 2013 in um, response to the Zimmerman verdict. And we recognized that our name itself was intimidating to people, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, issues that are taboo. Uh, people do not enter um, with great energy. Um, and without some sense of trepidation. Terror. <laughs> At times. <laughs> um, and so we, we took some time to really think about what fearless dialogue looks like. And so we think about that term in a very specific way. Fear as a root word and less as a suffix. Less means without. Mm -hmm. It is virtually impossible to have a hard conversation with someone that you barely know about a taboo subject without fear. Mm -hmm. But um, as we were kind of brainstorming on this, you know, very provocative name, my kids were in elementary school and they loved compound words. They'd be like, Daddy, stop light, you know. <laughs> Trash can, I mean, like, they would just find <laughs> compound word, doorknob, you know. And, that, <laughs> and so we said, what if fearless dialogues was truly built like a compound word? Mm. It is possible for us to move forward with less fear if we are to name some of the palpable fears that are, um, that are potentially stifling to dialogue and so in our work we've uh, built a series of experiments to kind of help um, ease people into these hard conversations and to circumnavigate what we have found are five very palpable fears that um, are Share our those with people so if you can. Sure. Yeah. Um, the first is the fear of the unknown you know people walk into uh, spaces that they are unfamiliar like this, you know, um, uncertain of one, I don't want to bump into somebody and hurt them, but I also want to protect myself. And so that's how many people enter into conversation. The second is the fear of um, strangers. And we encounter all kinds of strangers on a daily basis, strangers in public, uh, like uh, the folks we'll see at Starbucks or as we're walking down the street, but they're also familiar strangers. Mm -hmm. People in our office buildings that we see them every day on the elevator and we may just have this unspoken pact that we don't speak. Um, so how do you engage in, with strangers around you? Um, there's also the fear of plopping and everybody say plop. Plop. Uh, what does that sound like to you? A mistake or an error, right? When we were working in, uh, you know, high schools and folks say toilet. Um, <laughs> but plop like water, you know, plop. And um, plopping is when you muster up your energy to share your most important truth uh, that you really believe is contributing to some dialogue and it just plops on the floor. <laughs> And, and everybody looks at it, and, <laughs> and nobody says anything. And um, <laughs> this happened to me a lot in grad school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but plopping is not necessarily about what you have said. It's do I value enough to hear what you have said? So it's do I see you as a person of meaning? 
And the, thir- the fourth is the fear of appearing ignorant. And um, we found that people who fear appearing ignorant fill spaces with empty words. Mm. Um, or they say nothing. And then the final fear is the fear of oppressive systems, that the problems are much too daunting and big mm. for little old me mm. to make any contribution. So I do nothing. And so um, what we seek to do is help people to know and name and understand that these fears are very present inside of us and around us and um, through these very interactive experiments we invite people to fear less and before I transition to Lucas I just want to say your term radical hospitality Mm. is so welcome and um, I just wrote a book and I used that term radical hospitality before I had read fearless dialogue. So oh. just when you see it come out, just don't, I just want you to yeah. know <laughs> it wasn't, it was before the fact, I but it's so it. organic yeah. that yeah. sense of what does it look like to extend radical hospitality. And in that, in that spirit, I want to ask Lucas to go beyond civic hmm. to love because ultimately, a lot of what we're talking about here is really where, what is the role of love in these conversations that you're catalyzing in your work and that you see in your work on reconciliation in the world? What is this arc of love as an invitation, as a practice, as a muscle also that needs developing the flaccid listening, <laughs> loving muscle? Mm-hmm. I think um, you know I had prepared in my mind a response to the civic thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I, I oh, really, no, that no, was no, bad moderation. Fine. No, it, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But you could. Start I mean, it, I was going to get to love. Oh, good. Can you start with civic then? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I mean I. What does civic have to do with love? <laughs> Take us there. Well, well, I'll say this. I. You know, um, Vincent Harding, um, who was uh, my dear friend and mentor and who I had the chance to accompany in the uh, later years of his life, um, he used to always encourage us when talking about the civil rights movement to not speak of it in that language. he felt like that was too lazy and narrow a description for what he and others risked and gave their lives for. Yes. Um, so he would refer to it as the Southern Freedom Movement or the Black Freedom Struggle or the Black-led Freedom Struggle. Um, and he would often remind us that um, the the motto of the motto of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was to save the soul of America. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about I think about the fact that when you when you love someone um it is an active robust process mm-hmm. um so there's this 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 story about you know the early pacifist leadership when you know so uh, Howard Thurman, you know, Gandhi, you know, said to Howard Thurman that it may be through the American Negroes that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be transmitted to the world, right? Mm. And Thurman comes back and he uh, begins to um, share what he's learned and uh, other leaders of the Fellowship of Reconciliation began to talk about this because before they called, they referred, this was before the language of nonviolence um, was really sort of 
made live or was translated and you know here and so and so people then called themselves revolutionary pacifists right and um and they were always talking about ways to f- finding ways to put love in action hmm. and at some point you know early um right before the the journey of reconciliation um which uh started which was the sort of the beginning of the core chapter of the University of uh, of Chicago so there was a debate about busing and whether or not they were going to experiment with these new methods of gandhian revolutionary love um and and in the context of the race struggle and a, a debate broke out about whether or not by um by uh doing this um by by traveling in, in as uh, as integrated uh on an integrated bus with blacks and whites together going south whether or not um we would therefore be provoking the segregationists to violence mm. and therefore committing a moral injury against them hmm. through that act of provocation so there was this debate about what the most loving thing would be to do you know because we would be provoking them to violence and mm. folks then uh folks like AJ Musty and uh mm-hmm. I think uh Byard Rustin was involved in conversations at this point mm-hmm. um said you know fortunately sort of ruled th- their arguments ruled the day and they said that we're not provoking them to violence we're we're holding a mirror in front of their face yeah and giving them a choice and say a, a choice of who to become and what to do and how to respond mm. and that is the most loving thing mm. that you can do mm. and so i feel like by inviting people into a hospitable place where we can do yeah. the type of moral wrestling Mm-hmm. that is necessary at this moment of our lives together as a as a as a community as a global community creating the space for us to do that the ethical and moral wrestling that this moment demands is a very loving thing to do beautiful mm. thank you just yeah, you just answered four questions <laughs> and I'm so grateful thank you Mirabai you want to just talk briefly about contemplative and where that place lives for you in terms of spirituality and social change where that or that was beautiful thank you um, sure <laughs> uh, yeah I guess I guess what I think is important about that is that the contemplative by uh learning by learning how to uh quiet down, look within, recognize basic truths, how we're all interconnected and interconnected with nature, how love is at the heart of it all by returning to whatever your practices are and renewing that in yourself um first of all there is the um there's the motivation for uh putting your energy into trying to make good change in the world um but also i found that the contemplative is really sustaining mm-hmm. that i i spent 10 years um working in Guatemala with Mayan people in the villages after the worst violence had happened there and um they um, it was such an amazing experience and they had nothing they had lost they had lost you know all their their houses had been burned down um they uh, they they had no food they had no seeds they had no animals they'd lost most of their elders some of their children i had never experienced such a desperate situation um and i was so moved to uh 
want to help in whatever way. So I was part of a, a foundation then, Save a Foundation, and we, many things happened. But it was so hard that, you know, I'd be in these villages and they'd tell their stories. And I just, I just wanted to fall into tears, and, and which was the last thing that would be helpful there. And also we didn't really know, like, what could help. And what I found during that time was two things, was that, that um, uh, using contemplative practices, I, for me that was um, mainly um, um, meditation practice and some others uh, doing mindful walking and yoga and so on, that they allowed me to keep going when I had no idea what to do next and when I was so overcome by emotion that I felt like I couldn't, I, I couldn't do anything. That these practices brought me back to center. They really helped me listen better. And uh, they, they also encouraged a kind of humility so that, you know, you make a lot of mistakes when you're trying to um, make change in the world. And uh, I found that these practices allowed me to let go and begin again and look for what might be helpful in this moment right now. Uh, and it keeps changing. Um, I, I worked with a lot of, um, of social justice activists during the, the contemplative mind period. And uh, lots of people feel that doing any kind of contemplative practices of, of quieting down, maybe going on retreat for a day or for longer, um, uh, and doing that kind of listening is, can be selfish. There's so much work to be done in the world that to take time out for yourself isn't contributing. But in fact, I, I, I experienced it myself and, and I saw so many people, even like the, the most convinced that this was not a good thing to do, but who for some reason or other were willing to try it. Uh, discovered that it is what sustains us and what keeps love alive um, and what also gives us the um, insight to make creative and good choices. So, yeah, those are some of the ways they're connected. That renewal of, of our interconnection and, and, and it does keep changing and, and just before we came out here, Brother David was asking us, he said, this is such a hard time. You know, what is it that um, inspires you or sustains you now? And then we all had a conversation about what does. And yeah, I, my answer was one that, you know, I, I hadn't given before. It keeps changing. So I think it's, we need to inspire each other. It's not so everyone needing, we all are needing one another right now. Our stories, our sources of hope and inspiration, it's one of the reasons we drew you together, knowing that you are rich sources of this, working really on the front lines. And so I think for me, this conversation of the intersection of spirituality and social change, right? What does that mean to explore that place? Um, I think it's, you know, there's a lot to be discovered about that. And one of the things that we've seen so much is they're, they're inextricable, right? So on all of these levels, we have profound social change, social justice movements that have risen out of deeply rooted spirituality. There's no doubt about that. I would be interested in knowing about what sustains you guys in the social change work that you do. How does that enrich your spiritual life? So knowing that we can rise really organically from those deep spiritual wellsprings into social action, how does social action in turn nourish your spiritual life? So I see you nodding, Lucas. I would love to hear if there's something that comes to you about that. I mean, I, I, I understand that in many people's understanding the two are separate or, or distinct, but I, it's always been a very integrated thing for me. I, 
Um, you will see who quotes Howard Thurman the most. <laughs> I have a quote from him too in my <laughs> present thinking. <laughs> you know, he, there's, there's some point, uh, and I can't remember, so Greg will be better at like citing chapter and verse, uh, but uh, he talks about how true religious experience not only sends you into life, but sends you into lives. Mm. Right? Mm. And, um, and I, I guess for me, um, you know, my, my sense of spiritual practice is also tied up with my sense of, I mean, it is, a, it is an inward journey mm. to be sure. Um, but it is very intrinsically tied to a sense of community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and that relationship to lives sort of imposes upon me a, uh, a responsibility. Beautiful. And I, um, and so it's all, it's all a part of my, the curiosity that, that grows within me is related to my religious experience and and compels me to act, act, right? And so I, 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 it's, it's hard for me to think of them as separate. Beautiful. Mm. Did you want to comment on that, Greg? Um, man, Lucas is so good. <laughs> <laughs> See if you can out Thurman him. No. <laughs> um, yeah, we're we're co-laborers in this work. Um, interestingly, I think what inspires me in terms of a deep spirituality and social action um, is looking forward and looking backwards simultaneously. Beautiful. Um, my grandfather, who was one of my greatest teachers, had a third grade education. He was from Mississippi, not Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and he used to say, son, we sit under shade trees that we did not plant. And we drink from wells we did not dig. And my grandfather, when he left in third grade to go pick cotton in Mississippi, um, at some point in his adolescence, he had this dream that none of my kids would ever pick a piece of cotton and all of them would go to college. Now this is a third grade educated black man in Mississippi in the 1920s. <laughs> he didn't know a black person with a college education. <laughs> and so I am the manifestation of his answered prayers. Mm -hmm. And so how I determine the litmus test on where I go, what I do, the kinds of encounters in which I um, invite myself into, mm -hmm. um, they're very much framed in that way. Um, how will this impact the lives of my great, great grandchildren that are not yet born? Mm. And I think that level of intentionality is, uh, it lies at the intersection of spirituality and social action. Thank you. We're gonna just that. we're gonna just take a second and let that quiet down. Did you want to chime in? Sure. Um, yeah, I I used to think of them as separate, you know, kind of do your spiritual practice and and 
you know, do what you know to do to wake up. And then work in the world is somehow separate, but actually they're a whole. And I mean, I find um, some people have said that they need to wait until they're more awakened, you know, that they understand better and that they are more open-hearted before they can do any action in the world that will, um, that will help. And there's some truth in that, but, because it's entirely possible to do things that don't help. But, um, <laughs> but actually, um, it's the doing from which we learn to go deeper and to wake up. Um, if, if we do it in a, with an openness to learning, yeah. from, to listening, to learning. And um, more and more, I appreciate that, um, that community and our interconnection with others um, is what, that's what's waking me up more than other kinds of practice. And so to be, to enter into situations where I don't know what's gonna happen, I can't, I'm less likely to um, leap into assuming I know who's in the room or what's going on and have to really listen and then learn from that. Um, those are the best practices that I know now for, for waking up. Mm. May I just please because Mayor by something that you said also reminded me of the fact that I I think one of our challenges today, um, if we if we think about social activism, is that um, yeah. we've uh, th there's there's wisdom um, in our traditions around that, 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 that teach us, that give us some insights as to how to be in community. And I feel as though, you know, this is a bit of a tricky statement to, to, to make, particularly on a university campus. <laughs> um, so someone may need, want to correct me later. But I do, I do feel like for example, we, right now, a lot of our movements, uh, particularly, let's say, movements to the left of center, we use a lot of critical theory, which is very important and useful. It helps us um, diagnose the problem. It helps us describe what's, what's happened. Um, and in, in my tradition, there's there's power in knowing the name of a demon. <laughs> um, and so it's useful to be able to name these things. Um, but we also need insight into knowing what to build after we deconstruct. Mm -hmm. right? mm. um, and then knowing how to build. And so I think we're at this moment where We've gotten really good at naming what what's what's wrong. Yeah. Um, and we need help in knowing where to go from here. And I think there's wisdom in our traditions that that we need to be able to to mine and 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 offer as a as a as a part of our pathway forward. Yeah, you know, when, when we started the center, we interviewed, I think, 40 teachers of contemplative practice. You were part of this. Um, and we, uh, from every different tradition that we could identify. And um, we asked them a number of questions, the relationship between the contemplative and um, social justice and so on. But one question we asked was, what's the danger of taking these practices, like, Meditation, like mindfulness, is a good example. You know, now it's like everywhere. What's the danger of taking these practices out of their original homes? Um, and almost everyone said, 
um, these practices have, they have their own integrity. So if people do them and they're not doing them within a formal uh, religious environment, they'll be helpful. But almost everyone said, but what you lose is the community. You lose, and it's names in every different tradition. Uh, you know, you, you lose fellowship, you lose sangha, you lose community. And we can't do it alone. And we need other people who are investigating and inquiring into the wisdom of the traditions to help us uh, through it. And I think that um, it seems really true right now. And that these practices that help us, though, have the open mind, the inquiring mind, that can look afresh, you know? Traditions that people have been looking into for thousands of years. Maybe at this time, we look and we hear it in a slightly different way. <laughs> and I'll tell you one funny thing about, like, us all, that's the first thing we can do is, like, try to keep open mind and open heart. <laughs> I have a nine-year-old granddaughter. And um, she uh, is great. And she, so um, she was graduating from the fourth grade, and I went to it and graduating from the fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after it, there was a picnic, and we were sitting at the picnic table. This boy around her age walked past, and um, she said, I don't like him. And <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever heard her say that before. I don't like him. And I said, why? She said, he's mean to me. And I said, well, what is Dahlia, what does he do or say? She said, he said the worst thing. I said, what? She said, he said I had a fixed mindset. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. And, <laughs> and then she said, and then she said, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I love that. Wow. Greg, I want to ask you to tell us some of what you're doing, because you're doing such bold, wild, fearless work building community and extending radical hospitality. And I think it just would be really awesome for you to share with us some of what that looks like in terms of everything we're talking about here. Sure. Um, so um, I've been fortunate to um, work with a, a really strong team of activist educators, um, artists, um, to build uh, what started out as just a, a conversation at the, after the Zimmerman verdict into um, a movement and now an organization. And so what we seek to do is to create these spaces that I share with you um, by extending this kind of hospitality that helps to lower the anxiety. So, um, for instance, we uh, have been invited to work uh, with corporate groups and community centers and, um, you know, church bodies as well as church leadership, uh, universities and uh, what we do, we, just last week we were in St. Joseph's, uh, Missouri, uh, which is a town that has been really hard hit uh, by um, factories that have kind of closed down and there's a, a huge drug problem uh, in, in this community. And so uh, people were invited into this space of fearless dialogues and so what we did was we met them in the parking lot as they were getting out of their cars. And we greeted them uh, with our standard greeting. It's good to see you. And we looked people in the eyes. Really good to see you. Welcome to Fearless Dialogues. Are you ready for change? And um, yeah, some people are like, huh? <laughs> you know? And so, um, but by, by the time they actually walk into the door, they would have received that greeting three times. And um, they realized that maybe this is different. We're not coming here to fight. And um, I, one, one quick story, um, there was a, we were invited to uh, 
do a session at Yale. And uh, we were on the campus of Yale Divinity School. And Ms. Rachel, we, we were greeting people as they walked in and there was this guy from a prison choir. And he said, you know, I really don't like to sing, but I like to breathe fresh air. So, uh, <laughs> 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 and so, That's and he cool. said, you know, I really don't want to be here either. And, and so I greeted him. I said, it's good to see you, my brother. And I looked him deep in the eye and I said, what's your name? And he gave me his name and I said, welcome to Fearless Dialogue. Are you ready for change? And he, he jumped like this and he walked off like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> And then a few minutes before the session, he came back and he said, my brother, whatever you say when we go inside, I've already gotten what I need. You're the first person that's looked me in my eye and called me by name in over six months. Wow. And so what we seek to do at Fearless Dialogues is to create these spaces uh, where people can begin to see each other. And so our work is built on these three pillars. If uh, see, hear, and change, it's good to see you. Welcome to Fearless Dialogues here. Are you ready for change? And our belief is that if you cannot see another person as a whole human being, or you know, if we're working in faith communities as someone made in the image of God, it's not p possible to hear what that person is saying as meaningful. Um, however, you know, we call together, you know, different kinds of groups in, in our churches and on our campuses to have these hard conversations and we look to change without first seeing and hearing the people around us. And we believe that if you don't see the people first and hear their stories, any change that's created is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just as Thurman, again, Thurman would say, <laughs> um, Contact without fellowship is the first layer of hatred. Mm. Mm. And so we seek to create an environment where people are not only sharing common space, but sharing of themselves mm. in a meaningful way, um, such that we could move into a place of relationship and then we envision change. So can you say that again? Contact without fellowship. Contact without fellowship is the first layer of hatred because it leads to a sense of indifference. So if something happens to Miss Rachel and I've been in common space with her, but we have not shared in any meaningful way. If something happens to, to Miss Rachel, it leads to, in, I'm indifferent to it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this indifference leads to an unsympathetic regard. Mm -hmm. And so if I really don't care, you know, if she then does something to me, I can hate her. Right. Because she was never human in my eyes, even though we shared common space. Let's just sit with that for just a minute. Yeah. That's a good deep breath point. Yeah. Thank you. Rachel, the listener speaks. Yeah, you know, one of the rules is that I wasn't going to say anything. So <laughs> <I'm> like, yeah. <laughs> you were in the room. Ms. But Rachel. you know what? We, we don't like those rules. <laughs> I just want to say, Greg, Please. to your point, if I do something to you or if you hear that I, if you hear a story that I or my kind is the cause of your suffering. Mm. Yeah. So I don't even have to do something wrong. Yeah. The story can be it if there is not the contact and the fellowship and the sistership. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Thank you, Rachel. Lucas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you looked my way, and I felt your name You're come across my You're going to the principal's office, Lucas. <laughs> Am I in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like
like to respond? Please. Um, you know, so um, the Civil Conversations Project with On Being um, began in 2011 um, in response to the shooting of Gabriel Giffords. Hmm. And you know, uh, those of you that know uh, On Being with Krista Tippett um, um, know that the show really centers around three animating questions. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be human? Uh, how do we live? And who should we be to each other? Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of after that moment, I mean, when Krista tells the story, she describes just the way that we all knew that there was a tie in our, you know, our public rhetoric and, and, and debate to that shooting, but it wasn't a direct line that could be drawn, and, but we all could feel that. And she, yeah. and she felt like um, there was something to be done um, because there was no space that really modeled how people could be in conversation with each other mm. yeah. uh, around, around these moral and ethical subjects in our civic life. And so, um, so she, she began to, uh, invite people to be in conversation with, the, with each other. Mm. And, and after, after she began to model this with, with the radio program and podcast, um, the response from people all over the country, all over the world was tremendous. Yeah. Because people began to say, I've just never heard this talked about in this way. And it just underscored the extent to which we we just don't have the conversations that we're pretending to have. <laughs> we just don't. Mm. Um, and and we don't have the conversations that we need to have mm. with each other mm. in order to in order to to have a truly participatory democracy <laughs> or in order to just be fully human with mm. each other. That's right. Um, and you. so I, I um, so it's interesting to me to hear about Greg's work and to learn about what all Fearless Dialogues is doing. And it's interesting to think about um, uh, how we might um, accompany your work mm -hmm. um, and and try to provide more models yeah. of of seeing each other in the eye and saying each other's names mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and understanding what's actually important to each other yeah. instead of trying to know each other by our political positions and whatnot. Indeed. Perfect. I want to name that our hour is almost up, which is amazing to see how that goes so quickly. And I want to just say before, ask before we part, um, and include Rachel in this uh, before our closing, is to really ask you what are the what are the signs, what are the movements, what are the stories, what gives you hope right now and gives you courage. And I'm hearkening to the poignancy of the moment around the table with Brother David and the need for us to surface the things that sustain us, both for ourselves and into the collective space of how do we commit ourselves to this work and this love and this fearlessness and for the long haul? 
how do we do that without surfacing what brings us courage and brings us hope and faith? So I want to invite each of you to just, before we close out this first half of the afternoon, you can talk about Howard Thurman again if you want. <laughs> but what, what are the, what gives you, what gives you a wellspring, what fills your wellspring of trust, courage, faith, hope right now? Anybody? Well, I mean, this was sort of a theme that emerged for me is that I'm, I, I feel like, I mean, for as, as, as frightening as things are, it's also an exciting moment um, because it's almost as though it's like a great awakening. A great a awakening. A second great awakening, perhaps. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes people will frame where we are in American life as they'll, they'll use, they'll say, they'll talk about how we don't know how to talk about, talk to each other anymore. They'll, they'll add like mm. the anymore to, mm. to things. I mean, as a, you know, my parents integrated their, their high schools. Uh, so I grew up in, in the southern part of the United States for the later years of my life. And my parents are come, come from the southern part of the United States. And so um, I know that there's a lot of conversations that have always been riding beneath the surface. Um, the ecological destruction is not something new right? It's something that we've been participating in for a long time. And what's exciting about this moment is the present awareness. And I just, I mean, particularly, you know, I'm on the edge of millennial, like I'm, Pew considers me a millennial, but some people <laughs> don't, I think. Um, and so really, you know, the people that maybe having the funeral procession outside right now, or, you know, I know that all around the world today, so first on the 20th was the student, students leaving their classrooms, and now the 27th, massive strikes around the world, uh, you know, the climate action. I mean, it's just, it's an encouraging moment for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that there's a lot of opportunity, um, and I think it's our, our responsibilities to attend to that, to this moment. Um, responsibly. Beautiful. Um, Carl Rogers, the psychologist, once said, that which is most personal is also most universal. And, um, you know, I, I'm really given hope by small encounters, mm. um, the seemingly mundane that most people might overlook. I think that's part of the contemplative life. Um, and seeing the eyes light up in someone who may feel as if they may have been overlooked. And seeing that as a mirror and recognizing that I do have a responsibility to see, but also to receive being seen. Um, mm. And so um, those encounters that happen within the span of three feet give me hope for the many, many, many um, feet beyond my reach. <laughs> Beautiful. Your arms are longer. <laughs> <laughs> see, now, see, I don't know. Lucas and I go way back, you know, <laughs> and so we've been doing this for the past day and a half. Like two so, feet you know. for me. <laughs> That's my dude. The last time don't you saw each other stage, Lucas. Ready? The last time you saw each other was eight years ago. Is that right? Maybe eight or ten. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So. There's some history the here. Part. Yes. Among many of our panelists, it's very sweet. Yes, indeed. Mirabai, do you want to maybe say something, and then maybe Rachel, you would Rachel close us. Or are you ready to speak? I was going to say you can close closing. us out because yeah. you you have 
that we have the privilege of your closing anyway. Thank you. Well, as I was sitting, remembering what I had <laughs> said to Brother David before, hmm. um, which I'll say to you, but it was about being inspired by young people, and that's part of the, these, this awakening into not just environmental awareness, but all the other, um, all the other ways in which we keep ourselves separate from each other. Mm. But um, <laughs> I was just thinking, okay, in um, two weeks, um, I'm going to turn 80. No and wow. And haven't old people always said, I'm inspired by youth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, and I mean it. <laughs> I get it's part of the natural unfolding, I guess. I feel really inspired by it. <laughs> it, it wasn't so long ago I was identified with, with being a youth, but uh, I've, I'm, I'm going to have to let that go now. <laughs> what? Not for but, two more weeks, though. I think you've got a little window still. But, um, yeah, I just I had a couple of experiences. I had these two um, young men teachers um, from Baltimore I worked with to, I, I lead a, an orientation each year for the incoming, uh, the, the incoming first year students at Amherst College. And um, they can choose from five different things and the most number of them choose what's called mindfulness and yoga. The first year I thought, um, wow, this is interesting, this, you know, this wouldn't have happened before. How many people are so interested? And um, then after doing it for a year or two, I realized that it's probably, for many of them, the choice is the least worst. You know, <laughs> they didn't want to go to the museum or do organic farming, and so <laughs> they came to us. But... Um, but this, so I've done it with different people over time, and this year, it was just, I was just so moved at the way in which the, like we're talking about um, social action and contemplation and community, and, but it, I really, I experienced the way in which for them it was all of a piece, and they didn't separate anything out from, and everything they did uh, held all of that together, and the way they communicated it to um, to the students was really great. And um, uh, I was saying that at the end, and even though they they taught very clear meditation instructions, eyes closed, practicing, but at the end, I noticed that uh, most of the students, when they said what it was they really liked, um, what they said. Um, uh, I like the breathing. Hmm. They didn't say meditation, you know? And it, so it, they just communicated that this is a human practice. This is who we are and what we do. And if we quiet down a little bit and breathe a little more deeply and pay attention to our minds, that can be really helpful. That was so great. And the other thing was then just right in the same week, I worked at um, Omega Institute with a young uh, teacher, he's still a PhD student at, Col at Columbia Teachers College, and he'd worked with other, other people in creating this 400-year timeline from the first, the first ship to bring slaves to this country was in 1619. Um, and so, yeah, so um, it's 400 years, and so this was like this beautiful timeline, it was all illustrated, and it it wove in um, the other things that were going on. It showed how really almost seamless the, uh, the what to say, oppression of native people and black people at the same time. Same people were doing it. It was really woven together in a way that, you know, I had somehow in my mind thought of those two things as separate, even though I knew historically they went on. Anyhow, and, and women's liberation movement was all woven together in this amazing timeline, but they were all really difficult subjects. We all know this. Like, And um, the way he did it was so beautiful. He had us, you know, 
um, be quiet first and just reflect and see what was coming up about just the idea of this. Then we walked through the timeline in silence. Then there was, to, and listened for what was really speaking to us. And then we sat, each of us alone, silently, and just noticed what was there and where, what we were feeling in our bodies in response to it. And then uh, we had people in, uh, in dialogue talking to each other about what came up for them. And, um, and then in small groups, um, and then in a big group. And there was, there was a, he was holding it with a kind of kindness and, <clears throat> excuse me, respect that I've done so many different conversations on all, all these subjects. And this was really beautiful. It was, it, it, people left feeling, ah, I was given the space to go through this in a way that really worked for me. And I wasn't just alone, I was also in dialogue, but um, there was a spaciousness around it that let it arise. So. Um, they were just a couple of examples of working with young teachers who I just feel are just doing such a great job. And, and I, I think it's, you know, it's possible that we will have a future. Can I, can I just say something oh, in, right. in response to Maribai? Because I, something that you're naming in this that I know that you do, because I know people who, who are close to you, mm -hmm. um, that is also an important part of this moment, an important part of the, so one of the things that's needed is, is really some healing around that, that's intergenerational. Yeah. And I know that a lot of, a lot of younger people really, I, I, I've had the benefit of, of having elders in my life that, that have accompanied me and nurtured me and encouraged me and I know that even though you're, you're just beginning to recognize that you're not one of the young folks <laughs> anymore, perhaps, but you've actually been modeling what it means to, to be an elder and to accompany young people as they are beginning their practice and as they are beginning to explore these ways that, that, that and going along that journey. And I know that you do that with such grace and such, such a presence that that really encourages them and helps them along the way. And so I, that was always, that was within the stories mm -hmm. that you just told. Thanks. Yes, it is. But I wanted to draw that out and name it and affirm you for it and thank you for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Man. So I'm gonna just. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Please, let's all take a breath and just open ourselves to Rachel's closing. Take your time, Rachel, and so grateful for you. Yeah, that's, uh, let this be an opening, actually. Thank you. To be a, an opening. Because what I'm hearing is, uh, I was also asked as part of our design, as we talked about, I would then stand up and do that kind of. But instead, I want to stay here in this arc of us. Mm. And I want to stay here in this arc of us. And I want to call forward in your heart of hearts what is resonating with you and what is inspiring you as we begin this opening together. Brother David sat us down and he said, he asked us what's encouraging us because he needed to know based on how he was feeling. Mm -hmm. And when Brother Greg turned to him and said, Oh, what is encouraging you? He closed his eyes and I watched him think of all the events in the world and look back at us and say, I'm asking you because I need to know. So I'm asking you because we need to know what's encouraging you. So as we take this time in the intermission to maybe look into the eyes of someone you did not come here with and don't know and say, hello, I see you. What's encouraging you? Mahalia Jackson was there 
when Martin Luther King Jr. was standing on the mall in Washington, D.C., and he was talking about something else, and Mahalia Jackson's sister, Mother Mahalia Jackson, said, Martin, tell them about your dream. So are you walking in here with a dream today? Have you had a dream that Brother David has inspired that brought you across the country of how many miles to be here with us? Have you heard something about fearing less or what it means to be in civic dialogue and conversation um, in ways that opens up possibilities where violence would have us like close back up on ourselves or this cross multi-generational journey that we are on together, has that shown in your life somewhere? And maybe you can share that story during intermission with someone that you just meet and reach over with however long your arms are <laughs> <laughs> and say, hello, how are you? It's good to see you. It's really good to see you. It's really good to see you. Are you ready to change, 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 change. Let's change the venue. Let's meet each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you back here at 315. See you back.